few weeks ago, to be exact, in the August 20th issue of Life magazine, there appeared an article by Dr. Wesley Schrader of the faculty of Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut, entitled, Why Ministers Are Breaking Down. I'm sure that some of you saw that article, for it was somewhat widely talked about. Those of us who are preachers very obviously are interested in any kind of discussion of why preachers might have mental breakdowns. But I believe the article may be of more general interest than to preachers alone. And I want to ask your indulgence for a few moments this morning while I read to you a brief portion of that article. And I believe as we think together this morning, you'll see that it has perhaps even more application to those of you who are church members than it does to those of us who preach. Dr. Schrader, himself a minister, began his article with these words. In the early part of last year, I was asked to help a 33-year-old Virginia minister who had recently been discharged from a mental institution after a confinement of several months. At the same time, I learned that one of the outstanding ministers in New York City had been forced to seek psychiatric help and to take a six months rest. These two men held strikingly different positions in the church. The young Virginia minister, who was well-educated and exceedingly capable, had a congregation of 800 members in a city of less than 30,000. Before his illness, he seemed destined for an outstanding career. The famous New York minister, on the other hand, had already arrived. A man of middle age, he had won honor, prestige, and acclaim. These two men of the high calling, though separated by age, geography, financial resources, and worldly recognition, had one thing in common. They were both victims of emotional breakdowns. In recent months, case after case of this kind has come to my attention. One of the most brilliant Baptist ministers in West Virginia has been on leave of absence for more than a year. His psychiatrist has recommended that he leave the ministry and take up different work. A congregational minister in Connecticut frankly confessed to me that he's kept going only with the help of the new tranquilizing drugs. They've been a godsend to me, he said. An Episcopal clergyman in Philadelphia is drained, exhausted, washed up at the age of 39. A Baptist minister in Tennessee has committed suicide. Because of emotional strain, a Methodist minister and his Presbyterian colleague in the same Ohio city simultaneously requested an indefinite leave of absence from their pastoral duties. A Lutheran minister in Missouri, a disciples minister in Texas, have just returned to their responsibilities after short-term treatment for mental disturbances. The director of an Illinois hospital, which gives ministers clinical training in psychology, told me, the majority of the ministers who come here for clinical training are themselves in need of therapy. Cases such as these, as well as samplings I have done in other communities and among various religious groups, lead me to the conclusion that the number one problem of the American clergyman is mental health. Mental and emotional breakdowns among our ministers, regardless of denomination or position, are occurring in an increasingly large num larger number every year. And then there follows in this article a few suggestions of what might be the causes. He, con he has in this section the conclusions that these ministers are not lacking in sincerity and genuineness of faith. They are not guilty of preaching one thing and practicing another. Then he disposes of another possible cause. He says it's not financial insecurity. And then he comes to this. The explanation lies elsewhere. It lies principally in the fact that the minister's role as conceived by the members of the church congregations has become impossible. It is a role that no individual human being, not even one of the 12 apostles, 
could adequately fulfill. So long as lay people keep demanding more of their ministers that they can deliver, ministers are going to continue to break down regardless of their mental and emotional health at the beginning of their pastorates. Then he spends quite a number of lines in telling about a typical minister's life. The average preacher works 10 hours, 32 minutes a day on the job seven days per week, and many work 14, 16 hours per day. Finally, he comes to this explanation. The average minister is expected to be a specialist not in one or two, but in six separate roles. Administrator, organizer, pastor, preacher, priest, and teacher. As administrator, he is responsible not only for the church's financial upkeep and physical maintenance, but must act as a general overseer of all those connected with its work. As organizer, he must provide the spark for church societies, fundraising drives, and special events. As pastor, he looks out for the spiritual welfare of his flock, watchful for any individual who needs his help. As preacher, his sermons give constant guidance in the relation of God to man. And as priest, he administers the sacraments and conducts weddings and funerals. As teacher, he must direct the church's entire religious education program. Given his multiple roles, given the wishes of his congregation, and his own concept of duty, the conscientious minister tries to fulfill all his obligations, but the time factor makes his burden intolerable. The result is that more than the average norm for the nation, ministers are having mental breakdowns. Now, I would like to suggest for a few moments some things that seem to me warranted conclusions from this study. And I do not ask any sympathy, and I've hesitated in presenting this lesson until having talked with our elders for fear that it might be misunderstood in coming from me, a preacher. And yet I believe that it points up some basic principles that we need to remember. I would like, therefore, for you for a little while to hold this picture of Protestantism in the 20th century with its preacher clearly in your mind. And along with it, I would like for you to hold a picture of the New Testament church, our guide and our pattern, also clearly in your mind. With these two pictures then before us, I want to draw a few what I believe warranted or warranted conclusions. The first of these is that back there when Christianity began, the church was a church characterized by simplicity. By simplicity, I mean simplicity of organization and simplicity of worship and simplicity of activities. But as the centuries have come and gone, that simplicity also has largely been left behind. And in its place, there has been a constant multiplication of organization, agencies, and so on, there has also been an increase of activities. Until today, in the 20th century, the Protestant minister finds resting on his shoulders such a tremendous breadth of responsibility in these six big areas pointed out by Dr. Schrader that it's impossible for him to get around to all of the places often enough to do a good job. And feeling failure in his own heart, maybe facing failure in reality, he breaks down. When I remember the early church, I think I remember it accurately as having primarily two concerns. The first concern was a very deep concern for the saving of men's souls. And that means that they not only were interested in baptizing people, but it means that they were interested in bringing to them the gospel of Christ with all of its teachings and of planting it so skillfully in the hearts of men that it would take hold of their lives and change their thinking and their behavior. Change it, in other words, lifting man up to a higher level of living in order that he might be happy in this world, well-adjusted in his family, in his other social relationships, and also that he might, by being lifted to this higher plane, be saved eternally in heaven. 
It's a broad area, but the early church was primarily concerned with changing people's lives, showing them a new and a better way to live, and getting them to heaven when they die. The other emphasis of the New Testament church was on taking care of the needy, the orphans, the poor, the sick, whoever else. And when you've said that, you've said the whole story, which simply implies to me that, a may, that maybe a good many things that preachers are called upon to do are at best only out on the periphera, and that maybe many of those things could be left off to the good of the doing of the main job. I think perhaps an illustration or two might serve, and yet I haven't the time to specifically identify the kind of things in general that I mean. In the old days when the church was new, it was enough to announce to the brethren that they were to give as they had been prospered, that they were to give generously, uh, cheerfully, and not of compulsion. But now that 20 centuries have gone by, you've constantly received through the mail letters from fundraising organizations saying, let us come into your church and help you raise the money for your new building or whatever it is. In other words, a business organization over in Chicago or New York set up to make money for the people, in, uh, for the people of that, that enterprise. Say, let us come down to Nashville, come into your church, learn the names of your key people, organize dinners, introduce slogans and techniques, work through family by family, and at the end, we will present you with your goal oversubscribed, we'll take our fee and depart. Well, when religion gets to that, it's gone wrong. Unless Christians can feel the love of the Lord enough to want to give. It's a sick church that has to call in professional talent of somebody else to come and put the pressure on the families and raise the money for a new building. And I think that says, perhaps in a simple way, the kind of thing that I want to say about some, some of 20th century religion. There are a lot of activities and there are many organizational aspects of 20th century Protestantism that need to be scaled down and simplified. And when done, it will relieve the preacher of a great deal of jumping through hoops and rushing from place to place needlessly. I think of it a little bit in terms of the Hoover Commission, which of course means Herbert Hoover and men working with him, who have looked at our government and have tried to scale down the excess bureaucracy that has grown up and encrusted around Washington. I think of it a little bit like the old houses that we used to build back about the turn of the century. They had lots of gables and lots of ornate carving, spool work around the front. You and I don't build houses like that anymore. We say there's too much, to use the trade word, too much gingerbread. And so we build practical, functional houses streamlined to do the job of that we want done. And I wonder if maybe part of our problem isn't that too many things have been placed upon the church and on the preacher, and that simplification and getting back to the old emphasis and the old fundamentals isn't what's needed first. The second of these observations that I would make is that the responsibility of leadership in the New Testament church, our pattern, was spread among a good many people. It did not rest upon the shoulders of one man. I think, for instance, of the church at Jerusalem, which is our primary pattern. In the sixth chapter of Acts, you read about a problem that arose and how that the apostles, who were, as you know, 12 in number, settle that problem of taking care of the Grecian widows by saying, we will appoint certain men to take care of that job, and we'll go on emphasizing uh, the matter of teaching. We will steadfastly continue in prayer and in the ministry of the word. Now, the Jerusalem church was a very big church. It began with 3,000 members, then had 5,000 men, and then beyond that it multiplied. It had many members 
Its primary emphasis was on teaching, and the leadership in that church was spread among at least 12 men, the apostles, and later on we read of additional elders. Now the same kind of emphasis is found when you come over to Acts 13 to the church at Antioch. There again was a big church, and in the first three verses of Acts 13, you read the names of the first verse, actually, you read the name of five preachers who were serving the needs of that congregation. They are Barnabas and Simeon and Lucius and Manaen and Saul. It certainly is in keeping then with New Testament pattern to have several people doing the teaching in the church. It was done at Jerusalem, it was done at Antioch. And that, I think, is one of the answers to getting away from the problem of the 20th century when one man breaks down because too much work is on his shoulders. But I would emphasize further that the pattern of organization in the New Testament church was not for the minister or the preacher to be head of the church. In the early church, it was a board of men or a group of men, and they are called elders or sometimes presbyters or bishops or overseers or pastors, those five words used as synonyms for that group of men who had the leadership of the early church. Instead of one man then being singled out, there are these several men, men whose qualifications are laid down in 1 Timothy 3 and whose works are also suggested there, who sit together and plan the work of the church, guide, counsel, direct, supervise, reprove, or in other words, rule the congregation. As we 20th century preachers look at the burden of work that comes our way sometimes, I think it's refreshing to see that God's plan was better with a group of men rather than one carrying the responsibility. The third and final major observation that I would make is that in the New Testament, <clears throat> every Christian was a worker. I'd like to refer to a passage in Romans chapter 12 for a moment, though it's very familiar to you all. In this 12th chapter of Romans, beginning in verse 4, for even as we have many members in one body, and all the members have not the same office, so we who are many are one body in Christ and severally members one of another. Now think of a human body with its ears, its eyes, its hands, its legs. We Christians all together make up a body, the church. And having gifts differing according to the grace that was given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of our faith, our ministry, let us give ourselves to our ministry. Or he that teacheth to his teaching, or he that exhorteth to his exhorting, he that giveth, let him do it with liberality. He that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Everybody, you see, was a worker. The foot had work to do just as the hand, the eye just as the ear. Some businessmen, perhaps, at least those successful in that, were charged to give generously. Others were equipped to teach. Others were equipped to do something else. But every worker, everyone a worker in the church. Well, now as time has gone by, in its place there has grown up the idea of clergy over here and laity out there. It's foreign to the New Testament. In the New Testament time, they were all brethren, each with a different ability, each doing a different job, but all equally important in the overall picture of things. There was no one-man pastor system in the early church. Rather, it was a group of men who served as pastors, the elders. Now, this isn't to say that the preacher is not to be paid. Paul was paid from time to time when he went from place to place. And he wrote to the Galatians in chapter 6, verse 6, Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Those who are taught to take care of those who do the teaching in all good things. And to Timothy he wrote, Let the elders that rule well be counted of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and in teaching. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox when he treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his hire. But while it is possible, and New Testament pattern is uh, precedent enough for it, for some to be paid in order that they may give their full time to the teaching or the work, if that's all that's done, the work won't be done. There's too much work for a few hired people to do it all. 
And so the emphasis in the New Testament church is that everybody who's a Christian does something, does much. Sometimes we preachers have been those who are responsible for the developing of the one-man pastor system, the problem discussed in this article in Life. We've done it because it means some prestige and honor, and we're human. At other times, it's been thrust upon the preacher by the congregation. A job needed to be done. They looked at the preacher and said, well, he's had certain training. Let him do it. He can do it better than I. And so he's done it. As a result, in many instances, the preacher makes all the announcements. The preacher leads the prayers. The preacher does the preaching. The preacher presides at the Lord's table. And the preacher determines the policies and the decisions of the church. And if you want to know anything, you ask the preacher. That's foreign to the New Testament. And so I'm thinking that the answer lies in training for every member of the church. More men's training classes, classes in which men may be trained to be elders and deacons, classes in which all may learn to do personal work and visitation in the hospitals, classes to train people to do every kind of work the church needs done, and then all working together do the job. It's very obvious that in the church there is much work. Much work could be underscored a dozen times. And it's obvious from the New Testament that the answer is for many people to do that much work. One man can't do it without breaking down. One man can't do it even if he does break down. One man can't do it. And so the answer from the New Testament is for all to do it. Every woman, every child, every high school student, and every older one, Every businessman, every woman who knows how to type, every printer, every builder, every architect, everybody who has any skill whatsoever will find a place where that skill can be used in the church. Don't misunderstand. I'm not saying to you that I want to be excused from visiting in the hospitals. I don't. I want to do more of that. And I'm sure that as Brother Howard Horton joins us in our work to be an, ad an additional teacher, like in New Testament times, he would agree. But I am saying this. If you wait for us to do it, we can't possibly do it all. There are 578 family units in this congregation, and that means a good many additional fathers and mothers and brothers and sisters and prospective husbands and wives. It means more work than any two or any dozen men could do. I want to do all that I can, but I want to do it with you together as Christians, not as clergy and laity, but as Christians. I want to walk the hospitals not as a paid professional, but as a Christian who loves his fellow Christians. I want to be with you when you marry. I want to be with you when someone dies. But I want to be there because I'm your brother in Christ and not because I get a paycheck that obligates me to come. And I want, when I'm there, to see you there too, elders and deacons and just everybody who's a member of the church. The only answer to doing the Lord's work is for all of us to do it. And the only door that enters through heaven, for me or for you, is a door that's reached finally after we've climbed a long ladder of stairs, stairs that are jobs well done in the service of the Lord. As we close this lesson this morning, we're inviting again those of you not Christians to go back with us to the New Testament pattern. We want to reproduce the doctrine of the New Testament, but also the spirit and also the practice. We want to reach back for that simplicity. We want to reach back for the kind of Christianity that was person to person and not institutional. When you add machinery, when you get away from face to face, you lose power. And so for the old paths and the old ways that Christ and his apostles used, we strive. And in the long run, the preacher doesn't have the burden because it's spread on many shoulders. And together the job, we do the job and do it better. If you're not a Christian, we'd like to invite you to become one now. Come down the aisle, confess your faith in Christ, repent of your sins, be baptized, and go on your way toward heaven, working with us as we work with you.
will you come while we sing?